So I'm Dan Scheiman. I'm the bird conservation director for Audubon Arkansas. I'm also the vice president of Audubon Society of Central Arkansas, a chapter of National Audubon. And our two presenters tonight were originally scheduled for Audubon Society of Central Arkansas's meeting, but of course we are not meeting. So they have agreed to give this webinar instead, which is great because then lots of other people can attend from all across the state and beyond. So I'm really thrilled that they have agreed to do this. So um, our speakers tonight are Marcus Asher and Jeremy Wood. Marcus has been with Game and Fish Commission for over four years, three of which he has served as the state's quail program coordinator. Before that, he was area manager for St. Francis Sunken Lands Wildlife Management Area. He previously worked for the Missouri Department of Conservation as a private lands conservationist and for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service as a soil conservation technician. During and after graduation from Arkansas State University, Marcus worked on songbird banding and on northern bobwhite and greater sage-grouse projects. Jeremy Wood started with Game and Fish Commission in 2018 as the turkey program coordinator. Prior to moving to Arkansas, he was the assistant wild turkey program coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission from 2017 to 2018. He received his master's in forest resources at the University of Georgia's Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources in 2017. And he also has a bachelor's in wildlife ecology from the University of Maine in 2009. Between degrees, he's worked across the country with numerous species, including the endangered snail kite, American oyster catcher, belted kingfisher, and brown pelican. So I'm delighted to see that our presenters tonight have a wide range of bird experience beyond game birds. Game birds are cool too, but I love all sorts of birds. So with that, uh, take it away, Marcus. Okay, as Dan said, I'm the uh, Quail Program Coordinator for the state of Arkansas, and I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of update on what we've been doing in the last three years. Uh, and also talk about, at the end, uh, myself and Jerry both will talk about um, some kind of citizen science uh, type opportunities. So let's get started here. Uh, so we all know uh, that quail uh, are declining as well as multiple uh, species of early successional uh, songbirds. Uh, you can see in Arkansas, um, you can see the decline and it's no different in uh, really range wide in the United States, as you can see here uh, by the breeding bird survey data from 1966 to 2015. Uh, you can see, excuse me, much of the um, United States, Southeast, Midwest uh, are, are all declining. Um, at least uh, one and a half percent per year. Uh, you do see, however, some uh, increases over the years in the in the light blue and the darker blue areas that you see on the, the United States map there. Um, but overall, quail are declining, and uh, the reasons are um, there's there's several reasons, but the the ultimate reason um, for the decline is is habitat loss, uh, and I'll go into that here in just a little bit. So first of all, I wanted to describe what uh, quail habitat is, uh, what stage it's at. So it's typically, uh, and I think this is one of the uh, key components as to why it's uh, so hard uh, for um, us as, uh, as humans to keep this, this type of habitat because it's an in-between stage uh, that they require. Uh, I said it's early successional, um, meaning that uh, it's not quite necessarily disturbed soil. It's, it's this weedy um, type community with shrubs, grasses, forbs, uh, and then obviously past that stage is a, is a mature forest. And so we have, I, I personally think we as, as humans have a, a tough time of, uh, we kind of like this either disturbed soil or mowed type pastures, or we like the mature forest uh, just visually. Uh, to us, whereas this in-between stage is, uh, let's face it, kind of rough, rough looking in our eyes aesthetically. Um, so, and, and plus it takes a lot of effort to keep it in that in-between stage as far as management goes. <clears throat> so what, what do quail need overall, kind of an overarching broad 
you can really get into the weeds, no pun intended, uh, as far as what, what quail need. But overall, they need nesting cover, broodering cover, uh, and escape cover. Uh, and you can see all these components throughout this uh, particular picture here, uh, whether it's in a field setting like you see in the foreground or in the background uh, in a timber setting uh, of which you can see if you look underneath those trees uh, up on that hill there, uh, you can see just as much grasses and forbs uh, escape cover uh, as you do in the timber setting as you do in the field setting there. Uh, so we want vast landscapes uh, of habitat with these type of components in there. Another shot uh, of what I consider as good quail habitat uh, is uh, it has grasses. You can see the broom sedge or the different uh, little blue stem, big blue stems out there, the tan tannish color uh, to them. You also see the broadleaf or the, or the weeds or uh, wildflowers that you see out there. Um, they need those components because those uh, attract a lot of insects. Um, they produce a lot of seed uh, and they also have a good structure to them um, to where there's, there's plenty of bare ground underneath, uh, but yet there's overhead cover um, above them, you know, for, for a quail to, to thrive and uh, escape predation. Also, if you look across uh, this picture or across the landscape on this picture, uh, you see a lot of woody uh, clumps out there that can serve as uh, escape cover, which is very important, uh, not only for escaping predation, but escaping the weather. Uh, so if you have really, really hot you know, summers like we do here in Arkansas, uh, a quail or, or any number of birds can get underneath um, that uh, particular uh, clump of shrubs or, or saplings or whatever, uh, escape, you know, have some reprieve from the heat. Uh, but also even during the winter time uh, can act as, as thermal uh, protection as well. So all those components, they don't need to be necessarily separate. You know, you don't, you don't have nesting cover uh, in one field and broodering cover in another. You need to have this all intermixed into the same uh, field systems or, or landscapes uh, over the entire uh, landscape of Arkansas. I put this in here because obviously native wildflowers uh, are very showy. Uh, they help numerous species, not just quail. As you can see on the very far right, that butterfly milkweed is, is helping uh, a species of, of butterfly, uh, but also numerous, numerous pollinator species are, are benefited by having these uh, plants on the landscape, the diversity of plants. And from my standpoint, these are excellent. Obviously, uh, butterflies are insects, uh, and, and some of these pollinators are insects, and so that provides a good food source for uh, the species that I manage, as well as the, the species that Jeremy manages as, as, as well. Plus, it produces a lot of uh, for, you know, a lot of seeds, uh, and has that you know that structure that I was talking about earlier, uh, with a lot of bare ground underneath. Here's a shot that's not, not necessarily so, so showy. Uh, it's a shot of Fort Chaffee uh, in the wintertime. Uh, but again, this is, this is one of the areas that has a lot of quail on it, and, and, and it's indicative of, of the habitat that's there. You can see all the different components that I talked about. Uh, it's got that brushy escape cover in the background, and then your grasses and your, and your forbs uh, in the foreground. And when I talk about grasses, we're, we're wanting more uh, native type grasses that uh, have a structure just naturally that grow in clumps. And so it allows uh, bare ground. It also allows when you have clumps, um, you know, it also allows for other plants to come up. So those broadleaf, uh, weedy, uh, wildflower type species to come up. Whereas say in an introduced pasture, um, those, those species of grass like fescue, Bermuda, uh, they don't allow for a whole lot of that to uh, grow, you know, grow on those type areas. So I said the reason for um, the decline of quail is habitat loss. And I'm going to take you through in particular, but this could be applied to really the, the entire United States, but I'll take you through Arkansas. Let's just start in, in the eco region of the Delta. Uh, if you you see on the right hand side, much of that landscape actually used to look, I mean, it had crops. Uh, there's no doubt that years and years and years it's had crops on it, but it used to have a whole lot more uh, odd areas that, that had those characteristics that I said quail uh, need. It had these brushy 
uh, either fence rows or field borders like you see in here. Uh, I had the grasses, I had the forbs, um, all right there uh, where uh, Covey or two or three uh, could thrive. Whereas nowadays, uh, you look at the landscape in the Delta and you could drive for miles upon miles and really all you would see uh, would be something similar to this um, this patch here, which this is this happens to be cotton, uh, but it could easily be exchanged for corn, um, soybeans, uh, rice, or anything else. Uh, and you really don't see any, uh, you know, any of these components that I talked about that quail need. So it's it's kind of really easy to see uh, why we don't have a whole lot of quail uh, in the Delta. <clears throat> you you move down to the Gulf Coastal Plain. Uh, where their crop uh, down there is pines, uh, live lolly pines in particular. Uh, they grow them very, very dense. And so thus, if you look underneath the canopy of those pines there in this picture, uh, you don't see any of this type of habitat. No, no grasses, no forbs. Uh, really, only, the only thing I see down there is pine, um, um, uh, pine needles. And so not only are you getting shade from the pine needles, but you're also getting the shade from the uh, pine trees themselves because they're so dense. Whereas if we had a case uh, where the pines were more thinned out, like you see on the right hand side, uh, you start seeing where through, and you see the burning as occurred in this area as well by the black marks on the base of those uh, trees. But you can see where they have uh, more grasses, more forbs, uh, bare ground, and I'm sure there's even some escape cover uh, patches here and there throughout this, but uh, without having that open canopy, um, you know, thinned out trees and and burning over time to manage it in that that type of stage, uh, these pine plantations are, are rather worthless as far as uh, you know, really any any type of bird species really. So you move over to uh, from the West Gulf Coastal Plain up to the uh, Arkansas River Valley and even in the Ozarks where our uh, once native grasslands have been converted into from this very diverse uh, type stage where it has all those, uh, those uh, different types of diverse species, the different types of uh, vegetation, grasses, escape cover, uh, shrubby type stuff uh, to now uh, we have basically in most of our uh, field systems uh, within the state uh, producers have converted those once diverse areas to monocultures of, of uh, introduced grasses. And, uh, and they do provide, you know, those areas do provide some structure. Uh, and yes, there is some uh, nesting that occurs and broodering that occurs in these, but they get really, really thick, as you can see up in the top right hand corner, uh, to the point where it's very cumbersome for any uh, bird species to move through that area. Uh, we want more of a open um, underneath or understory, if you want to call it, in the uh, in the field system there, like you see on the bottom right. You look at uh, our our timbered areas in like the Ozarks, for instance, where uh, we once had more conditions similar to the picture on the left, where it was open canopy woodlands or even savannas. So basically, it's a it was a field a field with some scattered trees or moderately scattered trees. Whereas we've allowed over the years, haven't really done too much management, uh, not, not much thinning, uh, and definitely not a whole lot of uh, prescribed burning. Uh, and so thus they've turned it into similar scenes like you see on the right hand side where uh, cedars or even just um, young oaks have uh, filled those spaces, those once gaps in the canopy and uh, we're left with very little uh, habitat for, for quail or, or any early successional species really. You can see here this is this is further depicting uh, so, somewhat of what I'm talking about uh, in, the, in the means of uh, cedar encroachment for instance you can see this is a map of Pea Ridge National Military Park up in northwest Arkansas uh, and you can see the dark uh, green on this picture uh, depicts cedar and this was in 2015 and if you look at this next slide this was a 1940 aerial uh, of that same park uh, obviously I don't think it was owned by the park at that time 
uh, but you have a whole lot more uh, open there. And, uh, and this was more probably that, uh, you know, self, uh, what is it, uh, self-sufficient, you know, farming, uh, so to speak, going on here. So you had a lot of different, you know, different vegetation stages uh, going on here, whether it's pasture or even uh, a churned up crop field or a weedy crop field or uh, any of those stages. Probably even a lot of burning was even going on uh, during that time period because it was an easy way uh, to manage your vegetation instead of, I mean, they didn't really have rotary, uh, rotary brush hogs or, or any of that type of me uh, mechanization during that time period. So a lot more open space uh, is the, the general um, thought there. Now we also have to combat, uh, I, I certainly don't think grazing is a bad thing. It, it can be very, very good, uh, but done uh, in the wrong manner, which you see here. Uh, this was, you can see the horses in the background, but I think this could easily, uh, if you drove through any parts of, of the Ozarks and River Valley and Washita's, um, this could easily be a uh, pasture that people graze cattle on. Uh, very, very short, almost pavement-like uh, structure to the grasses uh, where, I mean, that, that statement that I have there, I mean, could you see a, a successful songbird or quail or turkey nest and something like that? Probably more than likely not. I mean, it's, it's completely exposed. Uh, there's no structure, uh, very little to uh, feed on, even if something was successful. Um, so there, there's no insects or very little insects um, in this type of stage. Whereas uh, I think it's very uh, easy, easily applicable uh, to use cattle to do management in these type of systems and even using native vegetation, which you see in here. Um, you know, I think typical uh, producers would look at this field and, and say, uh, I need to spray that because I've got so many weeds. Um, but uh, you know, there's, there's many folks out there or, or several folks out there uh, that do in fact graze like this. I know several in, in Missouri uh, that use their cattle to just specifically uh, graze to create uh, wildlife habitat. You can see the different patches of open ground. You can see the forbs in there. You can see the grasses uh, and you can also see some pretty good looking uh, cows that look uh, fairly fat and happy there. So um, with that, so I said we need to have uh, more landscape scale changes in habitat. Uh, we need to gain more habitat uh, or suitable habitat on the landscape of Arkansas. And so one aspect that we've done is reached out to our partners uh, in specific the Forest Service um, to do uh, habitat restoration projects. So whether it's glade restoration, uh, woodland restoration, invasive species control, uh, and so forth. Over the last three years, uh, we have uh, essentially paid uh, these partners to do habitat work on their property so that we can get more early successional habitat. We've also done this with the Arkansas National Heritage Commission, the Nature Conservancy, excuse me, and uh, the Corps of Engineers. Uh, for a total, if you combine uh, these organizations with the Forest Service, we've done uh, just over 3,200 acres of habitat restoration on these partner agency properties in the last three years. Uh, I talked about Pea Ridge. That's our first, our first uh, focal area, 12 focal area in the state uh, that was created in 2016, I believe. And since 2017, uh, there's been over 4,000, uh, just over 4,300 acres of work done on this particular property. Uh, so in total, uh, for our partner agency projects, just, uh, just a little over 8,700 acres uh, that we've completed uh, restoration work on to create uh, quail and, and early successful songbird habitat. Another facet uh, of the quail program to try to further get more uh, acres of uh, habitat restored is we came out with a quail stamp. Uh, and this was kind of a two-tiered objective or has a two-tiered objective. We wanted to bring awareness uh, to the decline of quail and early successional songbirds uh, while also generating a little bit of revenue to um, support some projects. And in 2000, the 2018-2019 time period, uh, we sold just over uh, 10,500 uh, stamps and 
uh, we netted uh, through that about twenty twenty three thousand uh, dollars. So we combine that revenue with some additional dollars or match some of our own AGFC dollars with that. And we are currently doing a habitat project uh, mulching at uh, Fort Chaffee, uh, the Department of Defense uh, area up in uh, Fort Smith area. And you can see uh, we, we're spending just over $50,000 uh, to rent a uh, mulcher and the Department of Defense actually owns a mulcher as well. And so they're basically AGFC and the Department of Defense are tag teaming uh, some uh, cedar removal and also some of those, you know, woody grown up areas uh, essentially to create, hopefully uh, our objective is anywhere from 500 to 1,000 acres. Uh, and you can see the top picture here, uh, you can see all the cedar that was um, kind of uh, in an area right along a road system there. And if you look at the bottom uh, picture there, uh, this is from a uh, Sentinel Hub. I don't know if anybody's ever used that, but it, it's actually real time pictures. And you can see uh, kind of the work that they've done helping to open up that, that canopy of trees and get more uh, suitable quail habitat there. And here's just some pictures of the results before and after, you know, just a real brushy, shrubby, Type, you know, overgrown areas, and now we've we've knocked it back, and, and we'll continue to use uh, fire to maintain these areas. Same, same picture, or not the same picture, but a different picture of, of the work. So I talked about partner agency uh, projects that we have going on, but we also have a lot of habitat work going on on our WMAs. We have six. Uh, focal area WMAs in the state that total uh, just over 11,000 uh, acres. And uh, in this three year period, um, we've done just over 10,000 acres worth of habitat work, whether it's prescribed burning, disking, uh, wildlife stand improvement, uh, spraying, mulching, timber sales, uh, and even natural, you know, natural area uh, type restoration, whether it's woodlands or glades or, or so forth. Um, so, um, so for a total, uh, when you include the focal areas and the non-focal areas, uh, we've done just over uh, 38,000 acres of habitat work in the last three years uh, that, that creates a lot of good early successional habitat. So with that habitat work, uh, we also obviously just like any, anybody else, when we do some projects, we want to be able to see the results of that. Uh, and we're, so we're doing spring uh, bird counts to where we uh, are not only listening for quail, but also a suite of early successional species. You can see those on the uh, screen there, field sparrow, grasshopper sparrow, uh, painted bunting, prairie warbler, uh, yellow-breasted chat, and so forth. Uh, we do these counts from May to June. Uh, we listen at each point five minutes and re replicate these three times throughout that time interval. Here's, here's the results from the three years that we've been doing this uh, type, type work. So the top table uh, actually shows quail herd uh, during the, the three year period. Uh, and just to kind of point out the, the point that I was trying to make here. Uh, in particular, if you look at Little, Little Bayou in 2017, uh, we heard no quail. Uh, and now in 2019, this previous uh, year, we are hearing just over uh, 0.4 quail per point, and we're actually increasing uh, the number of uh, points that we actually hear quail. So we were hearing zero uh, at, the, at the first, and now at three different points that we do counts at, we're hearing quail on there. And then you can just see the same, same results depicted in a, uh, in a graph there below, but definitely seeing some increases. So. That's good. We also monitor vegetation uh, with these efforts. So we, we bust up the, uh, the area, the 250 meter radius area around those point count locations. And we depict what's there, you know, based on those habitat characteristics, percent grasses, percent forbs, uh, escape cover, and so forth like that. Uh, as a part of that vegetation monitoring, uh, the, the particular person that's doing that depicts what the, the area looks like, you know, what the different uh, cover classes that are, that are represented. And 
so hopefully over time we can see a change uh, in this. So we uh, talked about partner agency lands. We talked about our, our own AGFC uh, lands that we're doing the work on, but I think the most critical uh, in this whole uh, effort is private lands. Uh, private lands, I don't, I hear all kinds of estimates, but anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of uh, Arkansas's landscape is owned by private individuals. And so it's very, very critical that we get these folks on board to make a bigger difference. Uh, we originally had 10 private lands biologists before uh, 2018. And we realized that was basically saying, okay, you know, one biologist has seven and a half counties to cover uh, and however many multitudes of, of individuals to serve there. So we wrote a grant with NRCS, uh, matched dollars with them to get eight additional biologists. And over this last three, uh, three years, uh, those folks together with AGFC, PLBs have contracted over 50,000 acres worth of work through federal or state uh, cost share assistance programs. They've also held 220 uh, workshops uh, that has had six, just over 6,000 attendees and uh, 1,530 site visits have been conducted by these folks. So uh, really trying to reach out and get more habitat as well as also just educating um, private individuals on our, on our efforts and what we're, why we're doing uh, the things that we're doing. We also, not only did we get money to get biologists, but we've also uh, wrote grants to get uh, money to do those different programs, essentially. So we wrote a grant and got an RCPP for North Arkansas, the kind of the top 14 counties in Northeast Arkansas, or maybe not Northeast, but North, Northern part of Arkansas, uh, just over 200,000 per year for three years. Uh, last year was the first year that we funded projects. We got just over 570 acres of habitat contracted through that. Uh, you can see the breakout. Some of the bigger acreages were pollinator plantings, 140 acres, and 10% improvement, about 280 acres. Uh, and the key to this slide is to, so we wanted to prioritize uh, where these contracts were funded because we want to build on these focal areas. And this is one particular focal area we have in kind of North Central Arkansas, Harold Alexander. And in particular, some of the other uh, dots on here, the green and the per uh, pink, uh, were other programs like EQIF and Working Lands for Wildlife. And we kind of got a sort of, uh, you know, uh, an adjacency there. Uh, but we basically wanted to get uh, landowners within, you know, right adjacent to the to the WMA or out to about five five miles. And so you can see the red dots are um, where where we were able to fund uh, these RCPP contracts, which two are right adjacent to it, and the other two are within uh, probably a mile and a half of the WMA. So I think that was pretty successful. Um, talked about the, the the potential for native grazing, and we have a native grazing demonstration program. Uh, where the hope is to enroll 90 to 150 acres uh, per year, and we will basically provide seed, herbicide, and a, even a deferment payment while uh, folks are, are taking their land out of production and putting in these native, native grasses. And to hopefully when they're established, they will go out and graze appropriately uh, on native vegetation very good. So they'll follow a grazing plan uh, and even uh, once the grasses are established and the, and the landowners are able to uh, utilize the forage, they will have, you know, host field trips, filters, and hopefully entice other landowners uh, to see the, the success that these uh, landowners are, are having. So uh, one other aspect, we want to get more prescribed fire. Uh, and more habitat work done on the landscape. So we've hired a Quail Forever uh, Habitat Specialist crew. It's a five person crew uh, to do habitat work on private and public land. Uh, and we are utilizing a ranking tool so that we, as PLBs and other agency folks send in uh, these projects that will rank out and uh, hopefully, you know, get kind of a, a um, collaborative or, or um, uh, you know, a, a building of, 
of habitat work in certain areas so that it's it's more beneficial. This crew is fully equipped. They'll have all the you know burn equipment uh, and all the other types of tool chainsaws and different things to do uh, the different habitat projects. So, and to finish up, uh, like I said, we we are doing all those all that work, but we want to also be able to further uh, depict where we're seeing increases in quail, and so that's part of the reason that we're we're putting this. Um, this talk on is to get you guys participation, uh, uh, citizens of, the, of Arkansas, to help with collecting data for us. Uh, we do these brood survey uh, counts every year during uh, June to August time frame, and we basically want to be able to tell differences in reproduction over uh, long term, you know, long term trends in, in reproduction by eco regions. Uh, but we also want to be able to get distribution. Uh, gain an understanding of that so that we can help to define uh, where we want to do our work, where it's the most beneficial to do our work. You can see that we definitely have some gaps. And I'm sure uh, Jeremy will show this in his uh, talk as well. But we have gaps in where we are collecting data. You can see it's real heavy in the uh, Arkansas River Valley to uh, Washtenaw and maybe even into the Ozarks. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of areas in the state that we don't hardly have any. Uh, observation of adults or broods. So we want to increase that over the next few years. This is just a depiction of the quail brood survey app that we're going to talk about later. Uh, but basically it's, it's we're trying to get this, uh, this map filled up here to the right with uh, observations of quail and turkeys. And with that, if anybody has uh, interest out there in uh, you know, doing stuff on their land, on their lands, habitat work, uh, I would encourage you to contact our uh, AGFC private lands biologists or our quail forever biologists uh, to help you. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Jeremy. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Um, let's see here. All right, hopefully everybody is seeing my presentation on their screen. Um, so I'm Jeremy Wood, I'm the Turkey Program Coordinator for Game and Fish. I've been here for a little over a year and a half. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit tonight about, you know, trying to understand declines in wild turkey populations in Arkansas. And, you know, in recent years, oh, let's see, I'm not moving forward. One second, some technical difficulties, apparently. Sometimes you have to click the arrow buttons or the mouse once or twice, and it will wake up and start going for you. There you go. There we go, I think. So, you know, in recent years and probably, you know, essentially over the last, you know, 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot less gobbling activity being heard throughout the state. You know, we're, we're hearing fewer birds in the spring, seeing fewer birds. And, you know, this has a lot of concern for, for turkey hunters, managers, you know, just wildlife watchers in general that, that really enjoy seeing these birds. And, you know, this is something that's being echoed throughout the southeast, not just here in Arkansas. And, you know, back in 2014, some researchers geared together, grouped together to start trying to understand these declines in the southeast and, and look at, at reproductive trends. And what they noticed, you know, in pretty much every state throughout the southeast were these declining pulp per hen ratios, what we use as a, an index of reproduction and success each year. So what you see on the, the y-axis in each of these individual figures is the pulp per hen ratio. And typically what we we say is a, a pulp per hen ratio of about 1.8 to two pulps per hen suggests that you've got at least a stable to maybe slightly increasing population. And at the onset of most of the surveys in the different states, you know, whether it was the 80s or 90s, you saw substantially higher reproductive indices than you have in recent years. They've essentially been declining from as early as we started monitoring to now. Um, one of the difficulties though with this was 
each state was gathering data slightly different from another, which made it really difficult to understand trends from one state to another. So these researchers developed some best management practices to get a better idea of, of reproduction at a broad, broad landscape scale. And what they did was take brood survey estimates from July and August of each year within each of the states, analyze them the same way. And so these end up being slightly different than what individual states may, may estimate based on their historical methodology. But, you know, it shows a concerning trend. You know, this particular graph, it might make it look rosy and like the grass is greener on the other side in some places, because you see some areas with really dark green. But the reality is the majority of these green colors and the majority of the regions of these different states that are depicted with a with a figure you'll notice are are less than that 1.8 to 2 pulps per hen. Um, so you know we're seeing these declining trends throughout the southeast. And so that's you know kicked off a wealth of different research on on topics trying to understand why why reproduction is declining and what's what's going into that. And so to bring it back to, to Arkansas, and so you can see it a little bit clearer, um, you know, our, our reproductive indices back in the 80s when we first started were hovering above four or five pulse per hen throughout the state. And as you can see, you know, we're down in recent years to hover right around one pulse per hen. And at the same time, you know, during that, that time period, you have pulse in the thousands, which are actually the, the number of individual young that were observed each year. It was increasing to a point from the 80s until the early 2000s as those reproductive indices still remained, you know, above that two pole per hen mark. But at that point, when that reproductive indices continued to, to decline, we started then to see a, a sharp decrease in the number of birds that we were starting to observe throughout the summer months. And, you know, a lot of that was fueled by potentially poor spring weather. Um, you know, the one, the one positive blip we had was in 2012 and 2013 when we had a relatively dry spring compared to recent years with some of the flooding and things like that that we've received. So that, that's definitely a concern here in Arkansas. And, and with that, you know, from a hunting standpoint, you know, this is a game species. And so we're trying to make sure to, to maintain sustainable populations that are available for harvest while you know, maintain, maintaining themselves on the landscape. And you can see that as populations were increasing, so was harvest up until the early 2000s. And we near, near 20,000 birds in our harvest just prior to, or sorry, <laughs> we, we hit near 20,000 birds for our harvest at a peak in 2003, and then since then it's declined rapidly. Now there, there's been a lot of things that have gone into that that have fueled that decrease rather rapidly with decreases in the season length, um, decreases in the type of birds that you're able to take. We've restricted juvenile male harvester jakes to only youth that are less than 15 years old, um, whereas prior to that point you were still able to harvest either one or two jakes as part of your, your two bird limit for any hunter that was out there. So each of those things used to have a lot more significant um, influence on, on our harvest each year. You know, our jake harvest used to be upwards of 25 to 30% in a given year, whereas since 2011, that's down to 4% or less. Um, and likewise, so with these declines, you know, many people are, are trying to wrap their head around what's going on, you know, what factors may, may be related to these declines. And one of the most common things is predators. I hear this from just about every hunter I talk to, it's gotta be predators, they're the number one. And, you know, the reality is as far as nests and, and broodering go, you know, predation is the number one factor for nest and brood loss. And as you can see, a host of different species are, are looking for a meal when it comes to a turkey from the time it's, it's laid until the time that it you know, dies as an adult. 
And so, you know, you have species such as snakes, raccoons, possums, skunks, larger mesomammal predators like bobcats and coyotes, as well as avian predators like red-tailed hawks and, and great horned owls. And there's not a lot you can do for some of these species to manage them and potentially targeting some sort of um, removal efforts on one or a small suite of these species may end up actually just increasing predation rates from some of the other species. Likewise, you know, a lot of folks now that feral hogs have become more ubiquitous in the state, you know, over the past 20 and 30 years, um, they, they look to these species as being a, a big problem and a big cause for our declines. And, you know, from what we've seen with research and nest loss in eastern wild turkeys, we don't suspect that the feral hogs are, are a very big issue when it comes to direct impacts to nesting or, or brood rearing. You know, we do see a few nests here or there lost to hogs, but it's very few in the grand scheme of things. What's less understood and possibly more likely though, is that these species are competing for resources and may actually be displacing turkeys in areas where they coexist. Um, we have some research going on with the University of Arkansas at Monticello that is looking into that currently and we're looking forward to seeing the results of that here soon. But one of the other things that people, you know, they tend to forget about is we are probably the biggest or we are the number one predator of a male turkey once it, it reaches about four weeks of age. Um, you know, yes, here in Arkansas, we restrict Jake harvest, a lot of other states don't. And then males are highly targeted by, by hunters um, because of that gobbling activity and um, trying to get out there in the spring to chase them. But there's a lot of other factors and there's some other factors that probably are a lot more likely to be the cause of concern. You know, here we're looking at, you know, really rainy weather in the spring. You, know, you can see the trees are leafing out. Um, you know, cool, wet weather is probably one of the, the biggest factors for decreases in reproduction in a given year. And unfortunately, it's, it's out of our control as managers, so we have to think about other things that we can control. Um, but there are other factors, you know, as far as disease or um, hypothermia, things of that nature that can start to, to cause birds to drop out. You know, maybe they're caught lines in some areas, but just a contributing factor along with many other, you know, small little knife wounds, if you will. Um, I'm not sure if many folks are familiar with Dr. Mike Chamberlain from the University of Georgia, but the way he likes to put it is, you know, turkey populations and their declines, it's, it's like something that's being stabbed by, you know, you're getting a, about a thousand different cuts if you will. And, you know, each individual cut in itself isn't necessarily, you know, causing a lot of bleeding, but that combined bunch of cuts causes a lot of blood loss. And so, you know, we have other things, you know, like birds getting hit by cars on roads. Doesn't happen often, but it does. And lastly, and probably one of the most important things is, is habitat loss. You know, having quality nesting and brooding habitat is very important and critical <clears throat> for turkey populations to successful, successfully reproduce each year. And, you know, if you drive around the state, you don't see very many places that look like this image here. Granted, this is a longleaf pine forest in southwest Georgia, but what you see here is, you know, maybe knee tall grasses and forbs that easily conceal a nesting or, or brood rear and turkey while providing enough vertical or not enough vertical cover to completely obscure the hen's view where she can see any potential approaching predators or hear them coming and move move away from them. And so so with that, you know, trying to, to get at what ideal turkey habitat is, you know, Marcus touched on that quail have very specific needs, you know, and need that early successional cover that's kind of Whereas as turkeys are fairly general species, so they can make do with a lot of different vegetation types within their home range and a lot of different um, 
habitat types throughout their entire range, you know, as a species. So, you know, we say that ideal habitats anywhere from 30 to 60% mature forest, you know, 10 to 30% scattered pasture or grassy openings, and 10 to 20% old field or brushy habitat or 10 to 30% small grain crops. And essentially what this really breaks down to is you're looking at anywhere from 30 to 60% forest and then likewise 60 to 90 percent well all right probably did my math wrong 30 to 60 percent forest and then the rest making up of some form of open or early successional cover you know these birds need to go out and feed they like to feed on on grasses and forbs as they're coming up they, they don't feed very much on animal matter or insects except for during the brood rearing period um, where you know a growing pulp may take up words of you know 80 percent of their diet and in insects where on the, the flip side adults are really only taking about 20 percent um, the rest of it being maintained made up of seeds and grasses and things like that and within arkansas what we see is you know th this really isn't the case in a lot of places um, you know if we move into the delta for instance we have a, a third quarter to a third of the state that's very open, there's minimal trees out there, and it's essentially non-habitat for a turkey and unfortunately non-habitat for a quail in a lot of cases as well. What habitat remains, you know, is in islands and corridors along some of the river boundaries, um, some of our wildlife refuges and WMAs, you know, that's kind of the last remaining bottomland hardwood forest in, in the Delta. And then we start to move out into the, you know, other areas of the state, like the Gulf Coastal Plain, where there's a lot of pine management. And there is a lot of diversity there, which, which allows for turkeys to do okay. And it's one of the, it's the second highest harvest we see in the state, which suggests that we have probably the second highest populations of turkeys we have in the state occur in these counties down in the southwestern corner of the state. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, and the Ozarks up in, you know, the Fulton, Sharp, Izzard County range, you know, that, that's where we see some of the best diversity we have in the state as far as this good mixture of open land forested habitats. And turkeys tend to do well there. They're not doing as well in recent years. And a lot of that, I think, falls back onto some of the things that Marcus talked about, you know, with some of the the pastures and, and whatnot that we have that have been converted over to non-native mat forming grasses. We're, we're not seeing near as much habitat management in that area as maybe we once did um, that would have supported better numbers of birds. And then, and lastly, you know, some of our, our public lands and our largest public lands in the state are really overstocked timber. And, you know, there's not a lot of diversity there. You know, you look at the map and you notice the Ozark National Forest and the Washtenaw National Forest, it's essentially trees. You don't see a really good mixture of open land forested habitat in there. So, so trees can maintain themselves in there, but they're, they're really in pockets. You know, they find those areas that, that support their needs, but then they're not necessarily in every area of, of the forest. So, so moving on and trying to wrap things up a little bit quicker on, on this one, you know, with monitoring turkey populations and quail likewise, you know, we look at different things for, for monitoring like spring harvest. We use a spring hunting survey each year, which is ongoing right now where we track scouting activity and what the birds are doing in the woods, as well as then we monitor hunting activity. And then in the summertime, we conduct a summer brood survey. With these though, you know, there, there are a few problems to trying to monitor these populations. You know, spring harvest, we're only looking at a reported harvest. You know, there's probably a decent number of birds that go unreported each year. So we're looking at just a minimum um, when we think about how many birds have been killed each year. And what research has suggested is that approximately, or you use harvest as an index of your population, and he estimate that about, that harvest represents about 10% of the population. So like last year we harvested 
a little over 8,000 birds. So you'd estimate that Arkansas has near 80,000 birds on the landscape total. Problem being is that information came about while an entire male segment of the population was being equally pursued. And now with some of the restrictions that we have in Arkansas, this isn't necessarily the case. So we likely have stronger populations than what that math would suggest. And that's something that we need to get a better understanding of moving forward. But then with that, we've also had a really steady decline in observations on all the different surveys that we conduct within both of these programs. And with it, we found some degree that observations have been clustered throughout the state. So not necessarily everywhere is reporting data the same. And historically, you know, the turkey brood survey and likewise part of the quail survey, you know, these were done by agency personnel and then some of our agency partners like the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and maybe the occasional, you know, forester. And what you'll see now in 2018, just after I got here, I was reviewing our brood survey from the previous summer. And I noticed that these observations were clustered. If you, you look at the darkest green counties here, there's seven counties there that represent 48% of the data that we got that year. So that implements a really strong bias on the, the reproductive estimates that we generate. Essentially what's going on in the Washita Eco region and the Ozark Eco region are driving our entire statewide um, pull per hen index or reproductive index. With opening this survey up to the public in 2019, so last summer, you know, one of the goals was to start impacting this distribution of observations in the state. And I'm happy to see that we did. It didn't necessarily move outside of those two, two eco regions, the Ozarks and Washita for the most part, but we were able to start spreading out those observations a little bit and found that about 45% of the observations came from 11 counties in the state last year. So that was very encouraging and started to get us moving to the right direction. So with, with future brood surveys, at least my hope from a turkey program standpoint is that we can potentially start incorporating trail camera data to fill in some of the gaps that we're seeing, especially in the Gulf Coastal Plain, where you've got a lot of areas that are you know, locked up behind gates, their lease land. You might have a lot of folks that put cameras out, but they may not otherwise be there throughout much of the year. Um, we're hoping to do that to help continue to increase observations. And in addition, you know, continue to improve outreach to different folks within either the forest industry, Farm Bureau, potentially some of their, their members groups like the Master Naturalists and, of course, yourselves here at the Audubon Society, you know, reaching out to some folks that may otherwise not be necessarily as interested in wild turkeys or, or quail. You know, they are game birds and you think, oh, we, we see them around a lot and they're not as interested potentially as, as some other species that may be out there. Um, and so we're hoping to work with folks like you to continue to build upon what we have to get better understanding of of how these populations are doing so we can better reform management in the future. And Marcus brought up the online version of the survey, and I'm going to go through that here quickly in a second, but just wanted to show you that this is kind of some of the data that we were able to receive and start putting points on the map. And we're hoping for some help to fill in some of these gaps, you know, that we're starting to see. This was early last year. And so this isn't necessarily representative of all the 600 or so locations that we received through the online version of the survey. But, you know, we got a fairly good distribution very quickly and we continue to like to try to build on that. But if there's folks out there that aren't really interested necessarily in doing something on a computer or on their phone, we do offer hard copy versions of these, these surveys. So these are just a quick snippet uh, of each of these. And my hope is that we can find a way potentially to combine these possibly before this summer, and if not this summer, the next summer, um, to make it easier. And there will only be one data sheet that can capture both 
turkey and quail data. But you'll see that, you know, we just capture simply a month. Uh, we run these surveys from June 1st to August 31st each year. Um, we gather a little bit of information about the observer so we know whether or not they're an agency employee or if they're just a member of the public. Um, and we like to do this just so we can compare back to historical data um, when we weren't including public observations. And then at the same time, we can look at both our agency and public data combined and start building um, our estimates or building our um, data set of that moving forward compare from year to year. You'll see here with the quail data sheet, you know, that we're capturing the date that the birds were observed, the county, uh, as well as a location estimate, then determining what birds were actually observed. If there was chicks observed, making a quick age estimate of what, what birds you saw, as well as the the number of adults that may or may not have been seen and whether or not with quail, if they were in a mated pair or if they were just hens or males or unknown seen, seen individually. And then whether or not you felt like, you know, you saw these birds previously, either earlier in the survey period or just during that same, you know, section on, on your sheet during that day. Likewise, with the turkey bird survey, we're looking for very similar information. Um, I added last year trying to understand, you know, what groups we were getting to participate in and whether or not we needed to do some better um, reaching out to folks. So wondering whether or not folks were members of different conservation organizations or like NWTF, QF, and Pheasants Forever. Um, or Master Naturalist Program, Audubon Society, weren't members of an organization at all, or another one that we just didn't list. And as well as just potentially some outdoor activities that folks were interested in, participated in, just to get an idea of the folks that were, were participating in these surveys. And then likewise, again, you know, we're capturing the date, the number of male turkeys, female turkeys, young, estimate of the number of broods that may or may not have been seen because turkeys have a propensity for grouping up with other other brood flocks as the young start to age and so you know you might end up with two or three hens or females um, together with a, a group of poults that you know may vary in size from from very young to a lot older just depending on where they were when they hatched before they grouped back up and likewise, again, we look at whether or not the observation was repeated and previously been seen. Um, the county birds were seen in WMA and the turkey zone. Um, most of this information, though, on the online survey is captured for you. And so we try to make this a lot simpler. And the, the nice thing is that we can look at some of this data real time. So I'm gonna pull up really quick and hopefully I can get I get this set up on the right screen. But I'm gonna show you quickly. If you go to agfc.com and you scroll up to, let me see here, I'm just gonna go back to the main survey page because it'll be easiest. But for getting to the, the turkey management page, we go under hunting. Turkey, and then if you click on Turkey Surveys, and I do have a better link to this, which we'll, we'll explain later, but it'll pop you up here where you'll see the two opportunities for online surveys, the Spring Gobbler Hunting Survey and the Annual Summer Turkey and Quail Brood Survey. And we click on this, and it's gonna bring you a page that looks like this. And if you come in through the quail programs page, it should pop you into a very similar spot as well. I believe if I remember how we set it up right, right now is that on the quail page, you should get brought right into that, this previous page right here to see this. But when we pull up, we have the PDF version of the survey, so you can actually print and download the paper copy on your own and shows the contact information for mailing it back to us at the end of each month. 
Um, but if you're interested and willing to participate in the online and mobile survey, uh, if you click on the other one, it'll give you the option to open it in your browser. So we're on the computer, so that's what I'm gonna do. But if you're on your phone, you have both options. What I tell most folks to do is just to open it in their browser if they have cell service. Um, it works extremely well. It's a little more visually appealing. Um, otherwise, they have to download the Survey123 field app on their phone if they're interested in doing it. They know they're going to be in areas with little to no cell service. And what this app will allow you to do is then use the survey offline. It'll allow you to save your observations in case you still don't have service when you're done. And then you can submit them when you're back into, into cell service later. But when you click on the browser survey, it brings you to this page. And it's going to ask you simply whether or not you observe turkey or quail. And that's going to specify what questions it's going to pull up. So I'm going to pull up the turkey one. You'll notice that this is still currently set up for 2019. Um, so data observation is going to have to fall between June 1st and August 31st of, of the year. You can select the county that you're in. So, you know, we might say be in Benton County. And this is just a way in case, you know, you don't end up actually providing a location. You know, some folks miss it and it's set up to at least still capture Latin long, but it's going to be a generic Latin long in the, well, showing my house. So we'll move out of that. But it's supposed to be set up so that it kind of goes into the middle of a lake just as a default if you don't put one in. But you know, you might say that you're in, in Benton County somewhere and you can select that. Sorry, I'm having some struggles here. Um, and you can mark your location. That gives us the Latin long. So it gives us really specific information to where these birds are observed and helps us potentially understanding their, their distribution in the state and what habitats they're keying in on. Um, for turkeys, we also provide opportunities for folks that may not necessarily, you know, know the difference between male and female turkeys. So we provide some, some instruction and some just characteristics um, of both gobblers or male, adult males and, and hens or adult females. And then from there, you can mark the number of birds that you see. The defaults are zero. But if you see something, you, know, you can type in, I saw, you know, three toms today, or likewise, hens, poults. Um, if you saw poults, and, you know, say you saw eight, we'll make this easy that there was, you know, one hen observed. So you only had likely one brood. You then would be asked to estimate the age of those poults. So anywhere from one week, all the way up to, to eight weeks old. And we give pretty generic, just descriptions with a, a simple line sketch, just to have a good understanding of what those birds look like. You know, may not quite line up to what you see in the field, but we hope that you can approximate as best as you can. Um, and then you might estimate, you know, estimate their age from there. If you don't know, we just ask that you leave it blank. Um, it's not required. And then if you have birds that you saw that you weren't sure of whether or not they're male, female, Whole, you just enter those numbers here. Again, if you believe you recorded them before, yes or no. And then provide your name and affiliation. So if you're a national resource student or a professional, you click that and that's just gonna ask you for your work address, email address, just to verify. Or if you're a member of the public, we'll ask those same, concert, um, same questions that we had on the data sheet, your email, whether or not you belong to a conservation organization and which ones that you you may, and then you click submit at the bottom. So with that, I'm gonna pull out of that, unless anybody, I'll leave it up just in case somebody wants to see me go through the, the quail survey, but it's very similar. Um, so let's see if I can get back to here. Um, so you have both my contact information, so jeremy.woodagfc.ar.gov if you have questions about turkeys, and marcus.asher at agfc.ar.gov if you have questions about quail. So with that, we'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Jeremy and Marcus. Again, if you have questions, there's the chat box, type it in there, and I will relay the questions to our guests. 
And uh, I'll start with a question though. The surveys, are these just opportunistic surveys? So if someone's out birding, wildlife watching, and they run across a turkey or quail, stop and enter data, right? Yep. Yeah, these are, are opportunistic. You know, we're not looking for folks to actively go out and look for these these birds. We just hope that if you do see them when you're out and about on your travels, that you you fill out either a data sheet or or the observation online to, to let us know that information and where you saw the birds. Does zero observations have any value to you? Like I went out in appropriate habitat, didn't see any zero birds observed. Right now, uh, and I'll let Marcus speak to quail, but as far as the turkey program is concerned, that doesn't provide us anything at this point. We don't have a way to truly capture that um, and relate it to the other data that we have. Um, we may look into trying to use some of the observations that folks may put up, you know, when they put out their eBird lists or, you know, iNaturalist, you know, observations that they may have seen while they were out and note that if, you know, a species wasn't marked, it most likely wasn't, you know, observed. So we potentially can use some zero data that way. Um, but through this particular um, survey, um, it's, it's not necessary. I was gonna mention eBird because that's the way I log all of my bird sightings. In fact, I saw to quail at Camp Robinson special use area on Sunday. Just adults flushed them up, scared the bejeebus out of me. <laughs> uh, Dan, yeah, I think maybe over time, we I, I would personally like to add an option like that to, to the survey uh, to, to get an idea of, of at least effort, you know, to some degree. I know it's not, you know, hugely scientific, but um, I, I do think I, I want to add that at some point that we gotta gotta sit down and, and talk with our uh, uh, app guru and see what see what we can do to refine that. Also, you you mentioned the uh, native grazing demo program. I'm pleased to see that. Uh, National Audubon Society has uh, an initiative called the Conservation Ranching Program, which is very similar to what you are doing, working with ranchers on cattle grazing that is bird friendly. And then those ranchers enrolled in the program get to market their beef as bird friendly beef. It's just that that program right now is being done in Missouri and Texas and other states to our west and north. And, at this time, National Audubon doesn't have any plans to bring it to Arkansas. So I'm glad that Game and Fish Commission is doing that kind of work here. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think that's one of the keys uh, to getting, I mean, because there's so much acreage that is, um, you know, being managed by cattle producers. And if we can get them to have native vegetation and graze it a little more uh, friendly where we do leave more uh, more cover and and have more, a little more diverse diversity to the uh, composition. I think it'd be it'd be great. So, any questions out there? All right. Well, I hope you all enjoy the presentation. I hope you will go and buy your turkey and quail conservation stamps. I have done that already. So go out there, uh, download that app, log your observations. Citizen science is so important for birds and monarchs and all sorts of things. So please participate and be a part of the conservation solution. Thank you again to Jeremy and Marcus and thank you everyone for tuning in and have a good evening. Thank you.